the land is so untouched. Beautiful, beautiful land. It's very healing, very calming, very soothing. I could lie there in a tent and just listen to the sounds and, and hear the waves and the gulls and the sun in the in, in the tent, the shadows of kids running around. And you can sort of feel our ancestors out there. And it's, it's like a connection, some kind of a connection that makes you feel really, really good about yourself and about the land. I love it. We feel uh, a part of the land. It's me, it's us, it's my people. Uh, I always get, feel that sense of belonging to that land and, and that attachment. For me, my government is my land. I fight to, for myself because that's where I learn everything is on this our land. Not just my land, everybody's land. It's, you cannot beat it. You cannot beat the land. It's a wonderful place to go and wonderful place to learn. It's the best place to be is out on the land. I find for myself. It's just that it's it's so relaxing and so it, like you can go out and and even if you're going hunting or getting wood or it just it's just so relaxing and 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 put your mind at ease. Like you you forget your troubles because look at the beauty of it. Hey, and I, that's just looking from my window sometimes. You know, looking out at the land and everything, it, it calms me down sometimes. Yeah, but being out there is, is just so, so, oh, it's serene. It's so beautiful. Freedom. You can do what you like, you can go where you want. It's, uh, it's your way of living, it's our way of living. Uh, you can live in a house anywhere, but uh, when, when you talk about the land, um, that's, that's what um, draws you out. That's, that's, it's the freedom to just get on the skidoo and go, to get in the boat and go. Um, you know, boil up, stick cab and just riding uh, on the ice. Um, it's, it's definitely the land, it's all about the land. Land-based activity is very important and very special to Inuit, all Inuit, I guess. So you try to carry on with traditional lifestyles and traditional values as much as you can. It's not just fishing and hunting or gathering, it's something that my grandfather did and everybody else's grandfather or uncles or whoever whoever did it. It's not just going out and killing stuff, it's going out, it's like our culture, it's our tradition, it's been passed down from generations before, like our ancestors and it's not just like for sport, it's for how we feel because we're connected to the land. You're, you feel so proud when, I feel so proud when I see my son learning from his father, what he learned from his father and his grandfather especially. I think that's a very important part of our tradition and learning how to go out on the land, learning how to survive out on the land, I think it's very important. And I think it's very important for our kids to learn that and to just understand where, where we came from, how we grew up.
pretty much a way of life for people here because of the way the way we do things like for hunting and gathering and stuff like without it and without the resources then we got nothing. I think the land is, I don't know, it's, it's everything, it's who you are, it's what makes you who you are, getting out there and living in, and being one with your environment and leaving all the material things behind that you have in the community and getting out there. It's back to the simple basics of life when you're out there, I think. Well, I guess the area that we are in, I guess to us, I guess it's the, the way of living and our heritage and from our ancestors that grew up before us. And we were so taught with so much pride about how much we love being on land and living and, and, and eating our, our uh, traditional foods and all that. I mean, I think that is us living with our people, it really is. It's just freedom and um, food. I mean, everybody loves the uh, traditional food and to go fishing or to go hunting or to even go and get your firewood, it's, it's just peaceful. People feel a sense of calm and relaxation. They feel a sense of self, uh, cultural identity. Uh, it's just that feeling of being connected with the land. And uh, I think everybody wants to feel a sense of belonging, no matter who you are. And I think if you grow up here and uh, you experience the culture, that even if you're not so much involved in it, it's still part of who you are. And there are customs and traditions that you look forward to. And uh, whether that's in the community or whether that's out on the land, it's just that at that moment, you re everything just sort of comes together and you realize this is who I am, this is where I've come from, and this is what I want to be a part of. Land is like, the way I put it, it's like family, I suppose. It's like, it's a part of you. If you can't go off on the land, you're stuck. You're stuck in a routine. If you lose that part of the land, it's like you lose your culture. And, and to me, that's, that's wrong. I mean, it's like I'm a Newfoundlander. I always will be a Newfoundlander because I'm from Newfoundland. Well, if you're a native person and you're Inuit or Inu, you, you're a part of the land. The land is a big part of it. It's a part, it's part of your life. You hunt your feet, you do all, everything off the land. And if you can't do that, you're lost. You know, in a sense, you're lost. So, for me, going off of the land is a very, very important thing. Oh, it makes you feel good to get out, get out on the land, get out in the tent for a while, get out to your cabin. That's the lifestyle. Cabin and going out on the land. If you take that away, goodness, people will have nothing. Yeah. People like to go out on the land to feel good. Uh, if they can't go out on the land, travel a long ways to feel good. They, they don't feel like people, like that's the best part of living up here, like where else would you want to live here if you can't travel on the land. So uh, you know, they stay in town and they feel less like people. So the land has a lot of bearing on Inuit culture, even today, 21st century. Some of the best therapy that Inuit and Aboriginal people in general uh, can ever participate into is being on the land land-based activity going back to where we came from, going back to our roots, going out, going off on this day, like beautiful day today, she looked at you up. And uh, you could be just so happy to be on the land and 
and it certainly grounds us and keeps us grounded and it reminds us where we come from and how lucky and how fortunate we are to have what we got and uh, it's a blessing. We are a part of the land, the land is a part of us. Hey, um, we simply uh, can't uh, survive without it. Uh, we enjoy that land, hey, and the, the, you know, the bounties uh, that we get, we harvest from the land. It means everything. Uh, it's part of, uh, you know, uh, the land and, and that is just so much a part of our identity. And I guess if it changes, then we either lose something or we have to change identity somehow. It's just our way of life, like it's how we grew up going out on land hunting and fishing and, and picking berries. That's, that's our, our identity, that's who we are. We learned those things and now our younger generation is, I think the older people are worried that they're not going to have the same, the same thing and we're losing it. Like, uh, that frustrates me a lot that my children, my grandchildren and even great-grandchildren aren't going to have the same privileges that we had. It's, it's a loss of identity. Mm -hmm. For people who live in the North whose livelihoods kind of hinge on, on the climate that they live in, it's really important to understand that it's not just the meat, the fish, the fur. It's, it is an integral part of who, of how you're shaped, how your memories are reinforced about it, how you survive and how you learn from your elders and from your uh, family. Um, it's about appreciating the nature around you and using your own skills and gifts and intelligence to navigate that world. When you live in an isolated community, um, it, it makes a big difference when the temperatures change from you know, minus 50 one day to minus 6 the next day. Um, it makes a difference when the ice is not coming in until December and, or January and then leaving again in April or May. Um, you know, compared to a few years ago when uh, even six, seven years ago, um, we could drive on the ice in, in May from November till May and the last two or three years, we're noticing more and more that ice is not coming in proper till January and then it's gone again by April or so. Um, and it, it, uh, that feeling of being on the land is, is lost when that's gone. And uh, we all feel it. I'm really nervous going up there because everything is changed. You can see the ice changing and it's not like before, like you used to freeze hard and you one chop you walk on that, but I'm afraid to do that now. Because it's where it's warmer and it seems like when you chop it's a lot softer than what it used to be. So it's changed a lot. The ice conditions are, are, are quite different than what they used to be. Uh, years ago, the ice would freeze up in late October, November. You go on, it, before Christmas you could go just about anywhere on Skidoo. Now, the last three years, it's been January, the middle of January. And it's kind of scary in a sense because the ice is not like it used to be. It's scary, <laughs> very scary. Um, especially when you're, like my husband goes wooden a lot. Or I, I worry about him more, more than I used to before. Um, and 
I'm afraid to go out on the ice because, like my brother said, don't know where the holes are. Can't tell where the holes are unless you know about the land. It's becoming more and more noticeable, the change. The change is more rapid, if that's the right words I could use. Uh, I remember uh, like back in the old days when I was a kid and uh, with all the snow we used to have and how uh, elders could predict things like ice, weather, snow and that, but uh, uh, it seems like uh, probably in the last uh, 15, 20 years that the changes, and even today, like it's becoming more rapid and uh, certainly things are unpredictable and uh, we don't have the ice we used to have or snow, those kind of things, you know? So, yeah, there is lots of change. Um, from when I was a little girl, in November we used to have the start of the freeze up and my father would go seal hunting when the ice was thick enough. Not just my father, but a lot of other people from the community. You don't see that in November anymore. People not going out on ice to go seal hunting when the ice was thick enough to carry their weight. But some years you can't do that anymore because the ice isn't just isn't thick enough. Like a few years ago, we could be going to our cabin, say, right up until the end of May. But you can't do that now. It's usually March, middle of April, and that's it. And it seems like the snow melts so fast now, not like it did years ago. Like in a matter of a week, your snow is gone, your ice is gone. So it's, it's a big difference. I think it was two years ago we had uh, a road marked. And I think the depth was close to three and a half to four feet. We marked the road for Kane's Quest when they came through, and I think we got down to two feet before we hit any water. And this year, the boys are saying there's at least a foot of snow, and then there's about five inches of slobby ice. It's not even, it's not even solid ice. It's just slob. So we're thinking now when it warms up, the boys. If they're hauling a load, they'll be stuck in slush. Well, later freeze up, it, it means it's more difficult for people to get around on a snowmobile to gather wood to go hunting. So it's a bit of a strain on families in that respect. It's been getting a lot worse now for the last few years. Uh, a couple of years ago was the worst. Uh, we only had, a few, I think it was a foot or so, a few feet of ice. And then a lot of snow came in and it covered all up and insulated our ice so it, it, it couldn't freeze no more. And then uh, when spring come on, uh, come on really quick, uh, they thought and we had not much slush and the, the ice was really dangerous, so it wouldn't hardly fit travel on. So a lot of people that used to go up on the bay seal hunting and um, traveling to Goose Bay or wherever going cabins was uh, hardly got anywhere. It was too dangerous for going through and stuff like that. The other changes is the way the animals are, the way they're migrating. In, in the summertime, more often I see you know new species. I've seen one or two new species of bird. I've been on, um, I've been on work projects where we've gone far north, and you know we've, we've had to rewrite the books on how far species can go. The wind too. I find there's a lot of wind now, and there's a lot more wind. Like we have hurricane force winds now that we never heard tell of when I was growing up. Like it would be an unusual thing. Yep. It's a number of ways that I guess it makes people feel. Uh, it's certainly for like our elders and leaders now who are uh, no longer and admittingly they say, well, we are unable to do that. We're unable to predict so we're unable to offer the good old sound advice that we could at one time to young people traveling here. Uh, just an example, uh, talking to the elders, I, I was always a young person uh, more so than listen to the radio weather forecast. I'd always, before I'd go, whether it was my father, my grandfather, you know, get a little bit of advice on what do you think the day is going to end up to be, weather-wise. Uh, today, if you talk to the elders, they'll look at me or whoever and say, we just can't predict anymore. It's changed so much. When the biggest factor and the most respected factor we have is the weather, the sila, call it sila. Uh, when we have, we don't even know ourselves, it's certainly, it's certainly, uh, it's certainly something that we haven't seen before. And I think we need to ask more questions about that, you know, why things are like that. 
This is, I don't have all the answers, and, then I, and I'm pretty much sure not all the people in Labrador have all the answers, you know? So, it's kind of frightening in a sense because things change, and you don't want them to change if you're used to a certain thing of doing, doing things like hunting or fishing or whatever. And well, we all have liberty, you know? In the short term, in the short term, it seems that uh, it's more of an inconvenience. I don't know if this pattern continues. I honestly don't know if we can totally change with it and still live the same kind of lifestyle. When for most of the year here, for about eight months of the year, um, you get this feeling sometimes of being stuck uh, because you can't go anywhere. Uh, like I said, you can, you can drive on two or three kilometers of roads, but there's nowhere to go and um, come spring and fall, uh, people get really excited that the ice is soon going to be coming and, and they get really down when the ice starts to leave um, because that's their means of getting out of the community, jumping on the skidoo and just going. Um, so you get, um, with, with the, uh, I guess, the mental and emotional, um, you get a loss when the ice is gone. And then you have to say, well, it's another eight months now before we're going to get that back again. Like, it, it's scary. Like, people love going out on the land. People love going out ice fishing and, and wooding and going to their cabins. And it's very, like, tied down, tying you down. Um, Especially after we've been doing it all these years, going out on the land, it's hard. It hurt me in, in a way. It hurt me in a lot of ways, right? And because I, I kind of think I'm not going to ever show my grandkids just the way we used to do it, and it hurt. It hurt me, eh? Big time. And I just keep that to myself. I see everything changing and the hunting is changing, the fishing is getting, it's going away, it seems like it's not like it used to be. Everything is changing for me. Yeah. It's, to me, it makes me feel like there's a, our way of life is slowly, it's changing, but not a, it's not for the better because we're losing out on what, something what we always had. It's just, it's, it's, um, it's kind of hard to put in words, but it's affecting our way of life. It's very subtle, but it's, if you look at like even 10 or 20 years ago, to, compared to now, there is a difference in the way the, the climate change has affected our lives. People are not who they are. They're not comfortable and they can't do the things. If, if you're, something is taken away from you and you don't have it, a way of life is taken away because of circumstances that you have no control over, uh, then you lose control of a part of your life. I think it's really making people think about it a lot more. Um, things that we always took for granted, though we, ha we wonder, can we still do them? Which is putting a big stress on a lot of people because all of a sudden you're having to think, oh, I hope I can still do this. I hope my kids can do this when they're older. And all these experiences that you had, you want your children to have and, and those types of things. So people think about it, people worry about it. And it, it really is, a, um, it's stressful. No, well, it's kind of sad in a way. Because everything by everything, by the time you're older and your kids get older, I guess they're not experiencing the same thing as you are. I think that there are times of year when, when it is depressing. Like if you're, if you're waiting to, to hunt or to get your firewood or to just travel and you can't do that until say the first week in January, that's a very long time period from when you may have put your speedboat away in November to mid-January. That's, that's a long time. And I think it wears on 
some people's nerves, especially the people that do it a lot every weekend, every chance they have. I think it does make a difference mentally. It's very hard to explain because I know everybody in the community feels it. See, everybody's happy when they're gone out on, when they're gone off and I guess where people have to stay home longer and longer, it's hard on the mind day because some people lives for it. The impacts is going to be devastating. I think you're going to have a lot more people and stressed out and hurt and they'll probably lose their identity as it you know it'll have massive effects to my parents my older brothers and sisters myself just not getting out there to be on those places i'm sure that since the time when we did spend much more time on the land in the summers winters even people spending around here our crime rate must have shot up it has to have um, I'm sure our dependency on alcohol has gone through roof compared to. So look, the more you're staying in the community, the more you're interacting with individuals. I think that uh, it degrades the state, I guess, for lack of a better term. I think like our kids are not going to be able to see like what 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 we what we learned growing up or what we saw growing up, what we know today. So. I try to teach everything that I was taught to the kids and then help them see what, what it's like out there and how life can be if you want it bad enough. It's going to be sad where like, if they can't go out and experience those things, it's, they'll never know what it was like. I think it's going to be more, just more addictions, alcohol, drugs. Like before, the younger ones, they would learn from their fathers, but where they're not going out anymore, they turn to other things, whatever that may be. I don't want to put my community down or the people because I know what they've been through. So I guess sometimes they go the wrong way just because they're not going out on the land. But I know when people have to come together in our community, they're going to do it. There's a lot of love there. I mean, communities are pretty resilient. You're seeing that there are more community activities within communities that the community members themselves are planning. So that's really good. Some of the negative coping mechanisms that you see um, are increased use of alcohol and substances and negative kinds of behaviors um, because there is empty time and you have no ability to go out and do something productive. But I think as communities are growing and we're realizing how important it is that we support each other, you know, that the activities that we plan are hopefully taking up some of that time that would have been used in a negative way. You know, uh, as you know, it, like this, this life that we lead uh, and uh, being known as people of the sea ice, and if there's no sea ice, how can we be people of the sea ice? So. Uh, I'm sure that uh, when we when you talk about people's identity and their culture and uh, those uh, global warming impacts have on that and take away part of that then of course when people start to lose their identity then uh, there is uh, it affects their mental well-being to the point where you know they don't they don't know who they are those kind of things uh, uh, what are they able to teach their children about their way of life and things like that there's t t absolutely huge impacts that certainly I don't know what, how serious they could be down the road, but uh, it's best that we start to try to deal with them as soon as we can so that we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, minimize those uh, that we all agree will be huge negative impacts on our people. In some ways, I mean, every society has to adapt to change and growth and modernization and, you know, that's, that's fair, that's, that's what cultures do. At the same time, it's, 
it's very sad because the experiences that you learn from your grandparents and from your parents about being self-sufficient and being smart on the land and in knowing how to warm up when you're really cold, just, just the very basic things about how to survive, it gives you a self-confidence and an awareness that I think you're not seeing in all the generations that are coming. You know, I, I hope that anyone who's uh, looking at me today <laughs> uh, understands uh, just what the global warming impacts are just, and, and earlier when I said like they're becoming, uh, the change is becoming more rapid, uh, I hope that people understand that what we're going through and that uh, people have to realize that, they, hey, we're all in this together and uh, uh, the impacts that uh, you know my, it will have on my people and, and, and how we're going to suffer physically and mentally from this is, we don't know. We don't know yet, but uh, certainly uh, there's, it's starting to have impact and uh, just hope that we can all work together to try to, because uh, we've got to try to minimize those impacts and try to find out how we can work with them and work around them and still be a very good, strong people. To be a part of this great land, to be the pride of the new man, to know that we were born on these great shores. So listen while I tell, and it makes my own heart swell. I'm proud to be a son of land. Its rugged mountains rise above the oceans Where polar bears and seals are to be found Its sparkling rivers flow through mountain valleys Where the caribou and wolf and fox abound I love to hear the call of the geese in the early fall And see the black bear roaming by the shore And hunt the arctic air or fish the arctic char There's no place on this earth like Labrador its rugged mountains rise above the oceans Where polar bears and seals are to be found Its sparkling rivers flow through mountain valleys Where the caribou and wolf and fox abound There's not more to say, but I know we're here to stay, to live and hunt and trap on this great land. But most of all to me is to have the liberty, to be a son of northern Labrador. It's rugged mountains rise above the oceans where